united with Christ. Meet local churches with open doors serving throughout the Border Valley community and sharing the truth and hope of God's love and salvation. A presentation of Life Christian Broadcasting Television. And now, United with Christ. All right, good morning. This is Pastor Joe Williams with United with Christ. And once again, we're here to uh, go on a journey. And this has been a fascinating journey. This has been a privilege uh, for the past almost three months. Each week we have visited uh, a, a people group, a nation, Christians, our brothers and sisters in Christ, uh, the persecuted church. Uh, we've been all over the world. We've been in Africa, uh, right by in Juarez. We've been in Asia. Uh, this morning, we're going to look at probably our last country, uh, and it'll be a beautiful country, and a lot of wonderful people who live here in El Paso are, are from this country, or at least their ancestors are. And it's Korea. In particular, we're going to look at North Korea. We're going to contrast North and South Korea. And as I have been, I'm going to give you a crash course in the history of the country. And uh, I, I, I always tell you this up front, I'm, I'm not an expert, but I've been doing a lot of reading and studying this week. Uh, I love the Korean culture. I love Korean food, have lots of close friends who are Korean. Um, when I was uh, uh, in college, I stayed for a few weeks in a, a Korean family's home in the Bay Area. I learned a little bit of Korean. I've forgotten all of it except for just about one Bible verse, John 3, 16. And we're going to go over that uh, in just a few minutes uh, because I'm hoping that this message today, God's going to do something special with it. Um, let me begin by reading what I have probably just about every week uh, that we come on the air. John 16, 33. I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. Matthew 5, 11 to 12 says, Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. This is Jesus speaking. Rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. And then Matthew 10, 16 to 22. Jesus says, I am sending you out like sheep among wolves. Therefore, be as shrewd as snakes and as innocent as doves. Be on your guard. You will be handed over to the local councils and be flogged in the synagogues. On my account, you will be brought before governors and kings as witnesses to them and to the Gentiles. But when they arrest you, do not worry about what you will say or how to say it. At that time, you will be given what to say, for it will not be you speaking, but the spirit of your father speaking through you, who is the Holy Spirit, of course. Brother will betray brother to death and father his children. Children will rebel against their parents and have them put to death. So you will be hated by everyone because of me. But the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. And this morning, I don't want to run out of time. I won't read what I sometimes do in the book of Acts. But the uh, disciples were persecuted and beaten. And they said, we are going to follow Jesus no matter what. So if this broadcast today goes out into any place in the world, I want whatever nation that we're talking about. And this morning in particular, uh, in East Asia, in Korea, you need to know that Jesus is powerful no matter who the leader is, uh, no matter where the country's at. Um, let me quote to you two, two more verses, and then we're going to dig a little deeper into to Korea here. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. And then this morning, I uh, kind of reviewed a verse that I learned when, when I was a young man by a friend of mine from Korea. And it was John 3, 16. And when I, I went uh, to the Bay Area and was going to stay with this family and we were going to do some witnessing at Berkeley, uh, it was a, an, another interesting story that I won't share with you this morning. But I, I wanted to learn some things in Korean. And I was really struggling, especially with some Bible verses. So my friend taught me a song, which is John 3, 16 in Korean. And, and this is how it goes. And hopefully I, I won't 
uh, mess it up too much. Hananime se sanghu hi charang sahanara do senjaru jusesu ni nugudunji yesu du midumyan myal manhaji ahan ko yong senghu odurida yong senghu odurida you know um, children are great at learning songs about Jesus when you sing them a song. And I, I went on YouTube and I was listening to it and the, the, uh, the melody is the same. And I, I, I know that there's some words that I, I obviously mispronounced. My friend told me this morning that he could understand it at least. So maybe someone will hear that in Korean and that'll inspire them. Um, here's what I want to do this morning. I want to look at the persecuted church from open doors and tell you a little bit about Korea. Some of you who don't know much about Korea, all you know is what's on the news. If you're from a generation from the 1950s, you know of the Korean War. Uh, right now, you know that President Trump has gone back and forth negotiating uh, with the Koreans, uh, with one of the Kims, and we're going to talk about the Kims in a moment. But I, I want to start with the persecuted church so that if we run out of time, you won't just get a history lesson. Open Doors, as you know, over the last few months, we have identified the top 50 uh, most dangerous places in the world to follow Jesus Christ. Guess who's number one? The most dangerous nation in the world to be a Christian. Yep, Korea. North Korea is the most dangerous place. Let me read to you a few statistics that are startling. Um, North Korea, and here's the way they score the different nations, and it goes from points from 1 to 100 in the most difficulty, all right? Um, the persecution level in the population of North Korea in violence, 65% out of 100. Church life, 99%. National life, 99%. Community life, 99%. Family life, 99%. Private life, 99%. And this is based on the, uh, the most difficult uh, way to be a Christian in that nation, up to 100%. Uh, Korea is an astounding place uh, in a negative way in, no in the north to follow Jesus Christ. Let me read to you a few more statistics here. Uh, first of all, the, the nation of Korea, if you were to unite them together in the peninsula, uh, just off the coast of Japan, is sandwiched between China and Japan, in particular Manchuria uh, from the, the part of, of China. And then even it, it borders Russia. And the reason I say that, that's part of the history of Korea and part of the challenges that the Korean nation has faced. Um, the nation itself, geographically, is about the size of Utah and is also in the same latitude as Utah. And it is divided at the 38th parallel, the, the famous 38th parallel. Uh, and North Korea, uh, as far as uh, geography, is just a little bit larger than South Korea. But South Korea has many times more people. The population of North Korea is a little over 25 million people. But South Korea is almost 50 million people. And if you had a choice to be where you'd live, you would see why. Um, let me read to you just a little bit more here. The current leader of Korea, his name is Kim Jong-un, and he is the grandson, and let me make sure I, I say this correctly here, Kim Il-sung was the founder of the modern republic of North Korea, and then he had a son, Kim Il-sung, and now the grandson. And it is a unique situation. It is the only modern communist nation in the world that actually has a family dynasty. Uh, it uh, started out in the aftermath of World War II, and the nation was divided from the North when America asked uh, the Russians to come in at the tail end of World War II. The Russians came in through Manchuria and China, uh, and the North was communist, and the South um, was from America. And I mean, it, it's a real complicated situation to explain it. But we know that in the late uh, 1940s, the North was communist and the South was not. And then in 1950, the North invaded and we had the Korean War. And sometimes people refer to the Korean War as the Forgotten War. 
uh, because it was sandwiched in between World War II and the Vietnam War. But even though it only lasted a few years, only a couple years, it was one of the bloodiest, most ferocious conflicts that America has ever experienced. Over uh, a million uh, people were killed, almost two million people, according to, to some estimates uh, in the Korean Peninsula. Over 600,000 Chinese soldiers were killed. Over 30,000 American soldiers were killed, and many more of that were wounded. It was a bloody, bloody conflict and very complicated, and we don't have time to, to go into all the details this morning, but it has left the peninsula of Korea divided. And even today, the dictator, Kim Il-sung in the north, um, uh, has now acquired what? Nuclear weapons. And now we know that President Trump has gone back and forth and they're still negotiating with that and uh, trying to negotiate with China. So right in the middle of all of this are people who want to follow Jesus Christ. Let me read to you uh, just a few more statistics about the North. It is estimated that of the 26 million people in North Korea, only between 200,000 and 400,000 people are Christians. However... It is very difficult to get an exact figure because literally, if you are a Christian in the North, your life is in jeopardy. Uh, you can be put into prison for years. Uh, you can be starved to death, beaten to death, literally executed. People have been decapitated, shot. Whole villages and people are, have been uh, raised to the ground. Um, people flee from North Korea, they, there's no way they can get across the demilitarized zone, which is a unique place in and of itself. Many people are in the military could tell you much about it. Many of the soldiers from here in El Paso at Fort Bliss have been stationed in South Korea. And they will tell you stories that how even today it is a very eerie, intimidating place, about two and a half miles wide that goes all the way across the nation. And there are tunnels that sometimes they discover that were delved with underneath uh, for the North Koreans to possibly invade in time of a, of a, of a war. Uh, many, many people have been killed trying to cross. And now the only way that Christians or people fleeing for freedom, ironically, now listen to this, how desperate the people are in North Korea. They actually flee into China. And there are uh, missionaries now. In fact, there's so much to tell you. You got to keep up with me this morning because I'm going to jump around a lot. But this is this is fascinating. Um, in South Korea, there are more evangelical Christian missionaries than any other nation in the world except for America. So here is a nation that, at the turn of the century, only about one percent of the people claimed to follow Jesus Christ. And now in South Korea, in South Korea. 20-something percent claim to be evangelical Christians. About 10% of those would be Catholic. Almost 40% uh, are atheist. And then 20-something percent in the South follow Buddhism or Confucianism or one of the other Eastern religions. You know, I was a little bit surprised by that because I, I've heard about all the evangelicals in, in, uh, in Korea. And I know that the, the largest evangelical church in the world, in particular a Pentecostal church, is there in Korea. And, and I don't know how they, they come about with the figure, but they, I, I read from 500 to 800,000 people in, in one church. This is, this is amazing to me. Uh, one of the things I believe that is so fascinating and God is moving is that there are now uh, missionaries from Korea who've come to America. Missionaries from Korea who have secretly gone into China. And isn't that neat? to think about how God is not confined to the Western world or to one particular culture. Because you see, one of the things I hope you've learned over the, the last couple months, and let me slow down and, and make this point really sink in, is that, that God is so powerful and the message of Jesus Christ is so important that if, if God had to start with some little tribe someplace in Asia that no one had ever heard of, or, or, ah, he did. Where did he start? He started with, with the Hebrews. God told them that you are not the greatest or the most powerful of the tribes, but you are the apple of my eye. I love you. And I'm going to take you to be a light to the world to tell the Gentiles about who I am. Isn't that beautiful? God does that. But what I'm trying to tell you today uh, in America, we've had the privilege for 
uh, many, many years to be the ones who are the senders to tell people about Christ. But now, in this post-Christian era in America, I, I think it's, it's very ironic, and I think it's, uh, it's actually beautiful in a way, that now we have missionaries, in particular from Korea, who are coming to America to tell us about Christ because we have become so materialistic. So let me go back to Korea here. So we have a stark contrast between the North and the South. I was looking at some of the statistics and uh, it was just overwhelming. So let me, let me quote a few things to you here. Um, this is actually not from a religious periodical. This is from uh, a, a business periodical. And it, it breaks this down here. It says that in the South, and I quoted this earlier, about 29% of South Koreans claim to be Christian. And of that, about 10% of those are Catholic. Uh, 23%, all right? Uh, and then it breaks it down to 46% and all of that. And what that tells you, if you look at the North, when less than, uh, I don't know, less than a tenth of a percent claim to be Christian, and then you look at the North and you look at the economy and you look at how the people are suffering and literally people are, are starving to death, you realize that God touches every aspect of our life. You know, a, a lot of times in America, people like to just say that the North is backwards and that the North doesn't have freedom. And, and I agree with that. But really, what I want to point out is I believe a lot of the prosperity in the South, in the South of Korea, is because God has freed them. And when Jesus Christ frees you, He touches every aspect of your life. And I believe the same is true in America. And we can't take that for granted. Um, I want to go back and show you a little bit more about a comparison between the North and the South. And here's some of the, the statistics that I have here. Um, the average lifespan in the North is 69. And actually, it's starting to go down. In the North, it's 79. So 10 years difference, life expectancy. Uh, the, uh, uh, how much money each person earns, uh, individual uh, is about 1,800. That's the, the product that people earn in the North. In the South, it's 32,400. Can you imagine? And the only thing that divides them is the demilitarized zone. Um, I looked at the population, almost 50 million in the South and not quite 25 million in the North because many, many people fled to the South. Uh, I... I, I I won't bore you with any more statistics here, but I, I looked at all the, uh, the life expectancies, the birth, the infant mortality rate is uh, huge in the North. I will point this out, 26% infant mortality per 1,000 children and only 4% in South Korea. Um, I, I looked at some of the history between the North and the South and in the North now, they are trying to focus on what? the power of their military. The one place where they are ahead of the South is they have a huge military, one of the most powerful in the world, but that's at the expense of the people. Now, let me give you a, a couple more things that I think will, uh, will interest you. I'm looking at the history of Korea here. And um, one of the reasons why we need to understand the history of Korea, we would understand today why there is so much suffering and why some people came to Christ. And I, I didn't think about this. Because China is to the north, and there's always been invasions from different dynasties from the Chinese where they would take over Korea. Korea has always been very proud to have their own distinct language. Um, and then to the east and to the south, they have Japan. And then we know that the Japanese have always been a mortal enemy of the Korean people. And, and even today... Uh, when I visited China just a few years ago, uh, I remember speaking to uh, Chinese Christians. And even today, some of them would say, you know what, we still have a difficult time forgiving the Japanese. But I want to tell you something. Uh, this really encouraged me. In our own small church at one time, even though we're, we are a small church of sometimes 200, 150 people, at one point we had a uh, a Chinese family, a Japanese family, and two Korean families in our church. 
and all of them worshiped together in love and unity. All of them could joke and talk about different things. And, and they would talk about what kind of food was the best. And uh, they, they knew their history, all right? But they also knew, more importantly, that Jesus Christ had rescued them and rescues all of us and gives us salvation. And, and, and that, that encouraged me. Um, when I, I looked at the, uh, again, at the, the history of Korea, uh, some of you may not realize, and especially if, if you're from the West like I am, I was looking at the difference between the writing of Koreans and the Japanese and the Chinese. And I, I looked and saw and, and read here, and, and I don't want to uh, overload you here, but I think it's fascinating to find that some of the Chinese characters, even though Chinese and Korean and Japanese can be written either vertically or horizontally, that they have a lot in common and that there are a lot of Chinese characters in Japanese uh, and uh, even though the languages are so much different. Um, here in El Paso, we're very blessed that we can go to uh, restaurants uh, who serve Japanese food and some that serve Korean food and Chinese food and, and we have Vietnamese and I haven't even been able to talk about the persecuted church in Vietnam. Maybe if I come back on another time, uh, we'll be able to do that. But in the Korean church today, uh, being sandwiched between the superpowers of China and Japan and, and Russia, it used to be the former Soviet Union, I believe, and, and this is what I read. And let me, with the last few minutes we have, I want to bring this around uh, to the persecuted people who are living in North Korea. Before the nation was divided, Right? There had already been just a handful of Christians, missionaries who had, who had reached Korea. Uh, in particular, the Catholics had reached Korea and missionaries had reached there. But with the various wars, there was wars with Japan all the way back to the 1500s and there were wars between them and the Chinese and sometimes there were alliances with each other and there was wars when the Russians came to the Far East um, and even the United States and, and some of the Western powers had wars with them. And one of the things, ironically, that drove some of the, I want to say it, I don't know about drove, but it attracted the Koreans to Christ, was the fact that they saw a difference between Christianity and Westerners. They saw a difference between Christianity and the Japanese and Shintoism and other religions, between Confucianism, which most of the people in Korea used to follow. And so they decided that, you know what? That all these other people, all right, they may be doing things that, that we don't agree with and they are subjecting our, our country to all kinds of persecution. Yet there is one person that is unique and it's Jesus Christ. So even in the midst of all this intrigue and battles and politics, Jesus Christ emerged and that from what I understand, and I, I've, I've read uh, different uh, testimonies of people who have fled from North Korea, that uh, people in North Korea right now are holding on desperately to Christ. And they still have small, small house churches, even more desperately than they do in China. And they risk their very lives, like I said earlier, the number one persecuted nation to follow Jesus on the face of the earth is in North Korea. You know, Today, what we need to do with the last few minutes we have, we need to pray that Jesus Christ would topple the regime. I'm not talking about politics, but topple the regime in North Korea. Even if the two Koreas don't become united, that Christianity would be allowed to flourish in North Korea. That Jesus Christ uh, would not be a byword that would sentence people to persecution and death. And then even in South Korea, that the people in South Korea would not become so materialistic and successful like they have been in Japan and in America that they forget who Jesus is. For you see, we are always just one generation away from rejecting Jesus Christ. We need to pray for um, the Kim dynasty in North Korea. And, and I know this might sound a little strange, but what I've been praying for is that Kim would not just get rid of all the nuclear arms in the north, 
but he would come to Jesus Christ. Can you imagine? Do you know in the north they worship him and his father and grandfather almost like a deity. They have statues to him. They pray to him with the Kim family. We know that no man is worthy of worship, only Jesus Christ. So I want us to pray that Jesus Christ would touch his heart. Do you not think or believe that the same Jesus Christ who changed the heart of Constantine in the Roman Empire, can he not change uh, the dynasty in North Korea? Can he not touch China because they're interlinked and, and touch um, all the Communist Party? Can you imagine what if someday we looked back and we saw that there was a post-Communist Party error in China and in North Korea, not because, and I'm a proud American, but not because the West triumphed, but because Jesus Christ triumphed. Wouldn't that be beautiful? Think about that. And then what if someday it ended up that there were missionaries from China and South Korea and even former North Korea who came to America because they were following Jesus Christ. Now with the last two minutes, what I want to do is if, if this broadcast somehow goes out on YouTube to people in, in Korea, in North Korea even, I want to encourage you that Jesus Christ is with you. Jesus Christ is greater than uh, the Kims. He's greater than the Communist Party. He's greater than anything that you can imagine. And that Jesus Christ, just what we read earlier, will give you the strength and the power to share the gospel, to keep yourself alive, to triumph in the Lord. Maybe you're some of the Koreans who are in China today and, and you're witnessing the persecution that's happening in China. And you say, we can't go back to Korea we can't be deported back to Korea, but it's hard to stay here. Trust in Christ right now. Trust in Christ. And Americans, if, if you have opportunity to send money to buy Bibles in Korean, Bibles in Chinese and Mandarin, uh, whatever language it happens to be, or in Japanese. And, we, and even right now, it might seem strange, but I feel the Holy Spirit's asking me to pray for the Japanese. They have freedom in Japan yet they even have a smaller amount of the population who follow Jesus Christ because materialism is not the answer. Uh, you know, this has been a great fun time and a privilege for me. This will probably be the last time I'll be on the air for a while. So with the last 15 seconds, we're just going to end it in prayer. Father in heaven, we pray for the Korean people. We pray that you protect them physically and spiritually. Lord, we pray that the gospel would be set loose in Korea, Lord. Father, that you would touch them in the name of Jesus Christ, we pray these things. Amen.